Boston, right? <clears throat> I said Boston earlier, and everybody's like, no, that's wrong. Um, hello, Baltimore. Thank you for coming to this panel. It's going to be one of the best ones you've ever seen because there's some of the greatest people in the world up here. Um, it's not them. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Christina Blanche, and I am moderating this panel. It's on comics and music, and we have a, a wide variety of people up here in, that do music in different ways, um, all involved in the comics industry also. So I am going to let them introduce themselves to you, um, but I am going to say something about this guy over here, because he was like, I don't do the music thing, and I was like, you are the karaoke king. So, <laughs> I'm going to let him introduce himself. I am James Tynan IV. Uh, I write detective comics and Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for DC as well as uh, a bunch of stuff for Boone Studios. And uh, my karaoke song of choice is uh, uh, either Be Prepared from the Lion King or uh, Poor Unfortunate Souls from the Little Mermaid. Yes. <laughs> quick, quick line from it, come on. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Those songs. Uh, <laughs> well, if you look real hard. <laughs> oh, uh, see the thing. Yeah. Sir? I'm uh, J.M.D. I think for a minute to yeah. figure out who I was. <laughs> um, I've worked for Marvel and DC and everybody else for about 35 years now, so I'm not going to start listing things. Um, and before I was working in comics, I was a working musician. I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter. Um, I was also a music journalist for a number of years, and uh, that covers it. Well, I think and I'm not I'm, I'm not a musician. I'm a terrible singer, but I'm the writer uh, for the DMC graphic novels from DMC and um, the new Kiss comics. So that's my connection. Uh, my name is Charles Soule. I play bass for the band Six, uh, and I wrote Mr. Roboto. So if you know that song, that was, that was wow. <laughs> I, I'm also uh, I'm not actually a bass for that. Um, I, I write comics for Marvel DC, my own stuff. Um, I have been a musician for a long, long time. Um, my mom had been playing violin when I was three, and then I evolved into other instruments over, over the years. So music's been a big part of my life for decades. For decades. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about how music and comics kind of merge, because they're both very creative fields. Um, and everybody up here is very creative and very musical in one way or another. So I, I downloaded his album, which you can get on iTunes, and it's, it's amazing. I listen to it all the time. Um, I, was, I was shocked. So <laughs> that, that was a shock. That was, nice. that was wrong. No, I mean, I was. I, I understood was, what you meant. Thank you, thank you. It was just. He's so talented, and then I'm listening to this album, and it's like how many lifetimes and, and all these wonderful songs, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, it's, it's not quite fair that he's so talented in, in so many ways. Um, so, did you, I mean, what kind of was your transition, you, your music first, and then what, what was your transition into comics, and how do those still interact? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I think, those of us that are creative tend to be creative in whatever way we can express ourselves. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to draw all the time. Before I ever tried writing, I was an artist, you know? And then when I was in the fifth grade, I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. It exploded my brain, and I had to get guitar lessons, you know? And that's what really, I, I'd always liked music, but that ignited my love of music. And the dream then became to be a rock and roll star, you know? And I wrote songs, and I played in bands. And, um, I, I, I'm a great believer in follow your dreams, and you will manifest them. That dream, I gave up, and, I'm, and in retrospect, I realized I gave it up for a very good reason, because I don't think I could have survived the rock and roll lifestyle. I, I have a slightly compulsive personality. I think uh, six months on the road and I would have been dead. And I only mean that half jokingly. I'm much more suited to being alone in a room with my imaginary friends, you know, but I always continued, even after the years that I stopped playing in bands, like when I did this CD, I did it years after I, I'd been playing in bands, because my feeling is once a musician, always a musician that really informs everything you do. I had a revelation years ago that everything I do creatively, I do as a musician. When I write, I write as a musician. And I'm still working that one over. But comics is very musical. If you look at the structure of a page, if you look at the way, we, we, we tell stories in these little captions. 
And not just the words that are in the caption, but where the captions are placed on the page creates a distinct rhythm. You know, and the visuals are a counter rhythm to that. And that rhythm has to, to carry you to the next page and it creates a melody and on and on and on. Now, I don't say that I sit there and do this thing consciously, mm -hmm. but, but as I thought about it and looked at what we do, there was a real musicality, especially in comics, mm -hmm. in constructing a story <clears throat> in, this, in this weird medium that's filled with squares and pictures and squares within the squares that fall across the page in a certain way and have to lead you to the next page. And here's the verse. And here's the chorus in the double page spread, and on to the next verse. You know, it's an interesting thing. So, again, Dumplet is open. Um, I tried to get him to bring some this weekend to sell. Yeah, I was going to, <laughs> and I, I brought a small suitcase, and I couldn't shove them all in there. Okay. So, um, Charles, this is, this is going to make you all feel exhausted. So, you write songs, you sing, you record them, you playing the band, you're a lawyer, you write a thousand comics a day. Um, so how does that music help, like doing that music, how does that like help to fuel your creative process and your writing? Um, well, I think, you know, it's just as you said, like, you know, when you're creative, you're, when you're a creative person, you're expressing your creativity no matter what medium you're using or genre you're working, whatever you want to say. Um, and I think that I also absolutely think of comics as a, as, a, as a musical medium in a lot of ways. Like you look at a page and there's the impact of the page as, as a unit, you know, as what it looks like as one thing. With the dialogue balloons, the art, everything sort of integrated as one. But then you go in on a granular level and you read the, the balloon in one panel and then you see how it leads to the next panel and so on. And that is very, very musical to me. Um, from, from the, so it's, it's the, the panel, the balloon, getting wider to the page, getting wider to the issue, getting wider to the arc, getting you know, wider even than, than that to the run. And so all of those, you know, when I'm writing particularly one-shot issues, which are, which are issues that are sort of done in one and starts, the story starts and finishes in one issue more or less, um, I approach those like writing a song, right? Like the feel of it, and it's very, again, very instinctive. It's based on, you know, I, I study composition, like classical composition and jazz composition in college, among other things. And um, so I, I, I was trained in how to sort of pace a song and how to, how to, you know, the rhythm of it and the feeling of it and the way that it develops for the listener should be, should be a ride almost, like a, like a thrill ride or some sort of an experience that is not a monotone experience all the way through. The way you feel at the beginning should not be the way you feel at the end. And if you're doing it right, if there's art to it, you can, you can bring, you can lead people where you want them to go in music or in, in writing comics. So I think it's, uh, I, and not just in writing, right? Like I think that's probably true for many, many uh, creative mediums. So it's a skill set that's coming in handy for sure, absolutely. So Amy, you're writing Kiss and DMC. So like, do you like rock and roll all night and party every day? Um, no, <laughs> I do not. Uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> with my death wish coffee. Oh, with my death um, no, but were you fans of those before, or did you just kind of um, fall into that and and no, to, you know, to get into those characters, you like listen yeah, to Yeah, I actually, I do. I do. I, it's, it's like method writing. I immerse myself in the music. And um, here's the thing. I did I did actually play an instrument. I came from a very strict Chinese-American household where I spent years playing piano badly. Um, but I did it. And, um, you know, so uh, I was raised on classical. God forbid I should be listening to Kiss. All the cool kids were listening to Kiss. I was playing piano at home. Um, so this is kind of my form of rebellion, you know. Uh, but so I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting introduced to a lot of music now, um, and it's interesting because it's different. I'm an adult now, and I'm listening to music, and I have an appreciation for it. And I actually audited some um, uh, music theory classes, you know, because it's very interesting to me. Like these guys were saying, a lot of music. Uh, Comics writing is very similar to music composition. There are beats. If you look carefully at any good story or good arc, there's a rhythm to the way the panels are structured, to where the narrative is, and there are certain elements that repeat over and over again. Those are the best stories where you remember. You don't consciously look at it, but when you walk away from a story, uh, I remember this distinctly when I was looking at uh, Walt Simonson's floor and the way he was doing certain things with the sound effects and the you know thing. It's like wow, there is a rhythm to that that we remember later on in our subconscious. But of course, since I'm being as an adult, I remember it now. But that is the kind of thing that I consciously try to achieve in writing now. So there's music. The musicality in one way in terms of the structuring of the story, but it's also because I happen to be writing 
uh, stories for bands that it is, I gotta somehow infuse that kind of um, uh, vigor or aesthetic into the writing, because you can't hear the comic that I'm writing, but you're gonna be reading it, and you're gonna be, as a DMC or KISS fan, you know, if it's not right, you're gonna be like, well, why am I even writing it? It's, it's you know, you're just slapping on a logo. Uh, so it's super important for me to get it right. So I'm, I do, actually, I've been listening to, on Spotify, I've been listening to a ton of KISS albums just to like, you know, it's weird, weird but you know, um, that's what I do now. <laughs> they wouldn't say it's weird. They'd probably yeah. think that's great. <laughs> Remember the Kiss Army now? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. much later in life. <laughs> so, are you going to do the makeup at the next show? And they were talking about it. The Dynamite was talking about it. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think you would <laughs> Which one would you choose? I mean, you know, there's the four, right? I think I have to do a new one. I don't think it's right to choose one existing. There's been some talk about because of the Fox. I'm like, I can't really take on someone's persona. I have to create my own. Okay, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> he got the okay from Charles. <laughs> yes. Sure, yes. I actually walked out on a Kiss concert when I was a music reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Madison <laughs> Square Garden in the late 70s. And, and uh, just, but we got through about 40 minutes. And I, and sure. I you know what? I, I saw him once too, and I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, they're, they're, I, I appreciate their, their marketing and their ability to. Um, Generate a fan base in an army. It's amazing, um, but you know, I don't know. I'm a, I'm, I'm a musicianship guy. I don't know that they're always the best. This is terrible. I'm sorry. I love this. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever mentioned that before. <laughs> that the music thing with Kiss. Um, I shouldn't have. <laughs> Hall of Fame. Um, so <laughs> it's going on bleeding cool. I'm sure. Charles Soul hates Kiss. I don't hate. Kiss. Charles Soul hates Kiss. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> Kiss so Army say that again rebels. so we make sure that's yeah. the quote that gets out. Come on, yes. 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 on Twitter. Okay. So James, who was very he hesitant to be on this panel, but <laughs> if you follow him on Twitter, you will see a lot of karaoke things. Um, you, you do that yeah, a lot. Yeah, I do. Um, so I call him the karaoke king. So how does that, does it performing, like, does that fuel your creativity and... Then also, how how does going out and doing that music with with your peers, with the people that you're working with, how does that like does that bond you? Well, uh, yes. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. And honestly, so uh, to give a little context to you guys, uh, when Christy asked me to be on this panel, my first reaction was, I am the sort of person where. Well, I write in silence. I, I need I need a quiet environment to work. I don't listen to music while I work. I uh, and when I'm driving around, I'm a podcast and audiobook guy. I'm not a like my uh, my girlfriend and my best friend and roommate. Like they make fun of me all the time because it'll be like really important songs and I, I I've heard them before and I understand like and sometimes I can even sing along with them. But it's just like I, I can't tell you who did what song or anything. That's never been me. Uh, so when in coming to uh, the panel, it's just like I'm not sure what I have to talk about here. Uh, but honestly, my part of the reason I love karaoke is, and really what music was for me uh, growing up is, I came in through the theater side of things. Uh, it was musical theater. Um, honestly, that those are the things that you know I could you know talk for a full uh, pa panel about. Uh, the how the work of Stephen Sondheim influenced my work, and uh, just in terms of seeing how uh, you take a uh, you take a form and you break it to see how it works and see how you can still access the the core of what it is from new angles. Uh, you you try to stress everything to its limits and then you try it in new ways and you you know I, I like people who uh, stretch what a medium can do. Uh, but I, I was a big musical theater kid, and uh, I was, you know, I'm also, uh, I have a deep voice and I'm a bass singer, so I only, there are only a few things I can do. So in terms of karaoke, it's always been, uh, a lot of times it's Disney villain songs, because it's a lot of fun, but musical theater tends to actually have uh, roles that, like, where you can really, like, deep bellowing songs that, uh, really get to the heart of a real uh, emotion. And that, that's something that I do think about a lot in my writing. And, you know, uh, I remember one of the first things that I was uh, told in, you know, when I was being taught writing is that people don't speak in speeches. And I, for one, I don't think that's true. People always speak in speeches. Uh, but 
Uh, I certainly do, at least. Um, but I think that there's uh, part of the reason that that speaks to me is that I'm used to, in the in story structure, the moment that a character uh, comes forward and like it announces intent and uh, really goes through an emotional journey and analyzes an emotional moment through a song, and you see that kind of, those kind of moments in comics. I think sort of best examples in the modern era, at least in terms of like it, it, you know how Robert Kirkman in Walking Dead in a lot of his books, they he every few years he'll do the kind of two-page spread speech. Uh, and it's just sort of this is it's a kind of guiding singular moment, and in a musical that would be a song. Um, and uh, that you know, so but I do think about music while I work, and I, I've been thinking a lot about what I actually had to say on this. And karaoke is a big part of it from the other angle too, because uh, I mean, it's just it's fun to express yourself, and it's fun to see how a bunch of different creators what what songs speak to them, and what songs really like are important to them because you get a group a group of friends together they're all going to go to very different places and it all speaks exactly to who they are and music such a personal thing um it's a, it's a relationship that you have one on one and uh that that's something that uh, I, I find really remarkable and special and then you know and then sometimes you get to knock out a disney villain song and uh you know it's a, it's a fun powerful moment there there's a real gratification of the Oh, I did a really awesome job in front of a bunch of people, especially in a field where uh, most of my, uh, like, most of the time I'm just writing alone in a room, and then uh, it goes out there. Like, it, it's a good feeling. So, you mentioned you don't play any music, nothing, when you write. There are a couple of exceptions. Sometimes to get into a kind of Batman state of mind, there are a few things like the Dark Knight soundtrack really, it can, it, it helps me think, but it's not so much for writing, it's like, uh, it's more to get me in the right mindset, and the the other thing is the first track on the uh, Batman Mask of the Phantasm soundtrack, the choral version of the animated series theme. I think that if you're writing a Batman story and there isn't a moment that you could play that track to, it's not a proper Batman story. <laughs> <laughs> so. My question to the three of you, and you can all answer, is is when when you're writing. I mean, does does music uh, I mean, do you listen to music? Do you listen to silence? Do you listen to anything? I can't <coughs> listen to music when I'm, I can maybe start with a little bit of music. And even then, it has to be music without lyrics and singing. Usually like ambient music or some floaty new age music or something that, or even a soundtrack that goes in the background. But I reach a certain point where even that's distracting. Like, I can't listen to an actual song with, you know, a vocalist. That, it just distracts me, and it reaches a certain point where I'm so engaged with the story that anything else is going to get in the way, which is strange, really, when you think about it, for me, because I love music. But I, I, it, it distracts me. I hear Stephen King has rock and roll blaring whenever he's writing, and I would never get anything done. I can't do it. Do you, do you think part of that is that you, you wrote about music for so long, and you were a journalist, and it was such a huge part of your life that there's always that little part of you that's... Well, that's interesting. Well, maybe, or maybe just because I'm so connected to music, maybe the music is even more distracting because I'm my, well, a big part of my brain is wanting to engage with the music as much as it wants to engage with the story. I never thought about that. See that? Amy? You're so insightful. <laughs> I'm insightful. <laughs> yeah, now I have to think about this. Um, I don't typically listen to music when I'm writing, but what I usually do in the morning is that I start off the music. Um, when I'm getting ready to do what I need to do to get my kids off to school, etc. Um, and then I use it more as a tool, um, you know, like especially for Poison Ivy, I have to think, what music would she listen to kind of stuff. Poison. It's really, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a character. You didn't hear that, he said poison. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I did a, I, and it's fun, you know, you do things like, I, like, I think I did a Spotify playlist for, um, for Poison Ivy. It's not necessarily the stuff that you listen to, but just stuff that I thought was sort of, you know, um, speak to the to the art. Um, but yeah, I have to think about this. I don't necessarily. I don't. I, I don't deliberately not listen to music, but I don't go out of my way to play something. Um, I, I don't think I could do rock and roll. I think um, it'd have to be something in the background. Also, usually I'm writing in different places. I'm writing on a soccer field. You know, my kids are playing soccer, or you know, in a coffee shop. Um, and I don't typically wear headphones. I just find that really distracting. I, I have seen Amy at a convention 
right? You were writing Poison Ivy when we were in Brazil? In uh, I think I was writing X-File, but I was probably writing both. I think you're, and she's just there at the table, and I'm like, how? How with all of this going on are you writing? She's like, okay. Hey. So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's background noise. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, but you have to, you know, you've got a deadline, uh, and, and honestly, you've got, it's multitasking, you've got a lot of stuff going on, you just have to focus. And also, if you see an editor walking by, you want to look busy, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I only listen to Unskinny Bop, uh, which is, in fact, a, a poison. That was too deep a cut. Fine. Um, uh, I, the, I use music a lot when I'm writing. Um, I have like noise reducing headphones. I, I consider music to be a way that I can create a wall between myself and, and the world. Um, but there's different situations, like so if I'm, I'm on a plane, I'm always listening to music while I'm writing. Um, so, uh, but the, the type of music I listen to, sometimes it's, it's uh, I like jazz a lot, so sometimes it's jazz records because there's no words and you can kind of like let the flow help you. Um, but my really, my sweetest spot of sweet spots as far as music that I listen to is, is, a, is a record that um, I like very much. So it's, but it's not, it's something that I've heard many, many times because I like it a lot, but it's not necessarily something that um, is so new to me that it's going to be distracting because I'm not, like, I've learned all, I've learned what I need to learn about the album already, and so it's just sort of a nice soundtrack for me. But if it's something like I listened to in high school, like, I wouldn't listen to, like, I don't know, like, uh, like Nirvana or something like that, because that just sort of doesn't, like, that doesn't give me any energy, like, the way that it would have 20 years ago. So, um, so it's usually something like the Hold Steady is a band I like a lot, so I'll listen to them. Um, I don't know, there's, there's tons of stuff, but, but the other thing, the other time I'll write often is I'll go to, um, I'll go to the bar, right? And then it's sort of like what you were saying about kind of the, the, the music of the room is very useful to me. And so if there's a lot of people in a bar and there's, there's ambient music playing, there's people ordering drinks, there's conversation happening all around me, that can be a very useful music to me to help me write because that's, it works almost as white noise, but I also know there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of flow to the room. Um, the problem is when you go, so, so I prefer my bars to be either completely empty except for me and the bartender, and then I make it very clear to the bartender that I'm not to be bothered. Uh, that's nice. I usually will do that around like 4 in the afternoon. And, but there's this terrible time of day which hits right around 6.30 or 7, which is when a few people come in, but it's not full yet. So they'll be like, you know, they'll be talking, and that conversation is like a spike in my head because I, I start listening to it and I, I can't, my flow is destroyed. So, uh, my favorite bars are bars that are about to close within the next couple months because nobody goes there. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, as you can imagine, they close and then I have to find a new bar that's about to close. So. <laughs> that, was, that was good. Um, yeah, so I, I listen to certain soundtracks. Mm -hmm. um, Tron Legacy is that's a really good great. one. Yeah. Uh, but I, I always have to, like, there's, there's one where Jeff Bridges talks on, yes, on yes. it. The Grid. The grid. Yeah. And yeah, and so I, that always like pulls me out because I'm like, oh, it's Jeff Bridges. Um, you know, actually, you want a recommendation? I, I mean, this, that's, there's a music panel, right? So music recommendations. There's a movie called um, Shitfire. Uh, it's not called Shitfire. It's called <laughs> Shitfire. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's called. It's it's kind of it's like Tron Legacy a little bit. It's a net, you can see it on Netflix. These guys, these Canadian folks, made it. All right, I'll, I'll just be with you anyway. Okay. It's in my, it's it's in my iTunes, hold the on. The Pacific Rim soundtrack is also very good, you know, and, but it also depends on what, you know, your, your, what, what, what I'm writing, I also write, but it depends on what I'm writing if, you know, I'm not going to listen to, you know, Pacific Rim if I have to write, like, a romantic singing. Well, actually, I would. It is. Yeah. It is in that movie. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but it just depends. If there's, the problem is there's no silence in my house at all because I have kids and I have a dog that is yappy. So there, there's zero silence, so I have to have something going on. Um, I also I have a thing like this meditation music that sometimes I'll put on and it's just to drown everything out. Um, but I said, it's like I live in a downtown thing. There is no silence. So if I just sat there, and I'm also a trained anthropologist, so if I go to a bar, I'm listening to every conversation that's going on. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what they're doing. So I can't, I can't do that either. So, um, and so you usually just you do the silence thing. I mean, I my office is in, in my house. Like, so I. Like there, are, there are times when I have to, in terms of like I, I have, uh, I live with my girlfriend and uh, three other roommates. Um, 
which is too many people to live in a house. Um, and they're like, if and we're all artists, and like everyone has different schedules. Like my one of my roommates is, is an actor, and he might be gone for like a week every single day, and it's nice and quiet in the house. And then he gets like a week off, and then it's just like he'll watch movies in the middle of the day, and it's just like okay, now I need to shut out. And then there are a few soundtracks uh, that I'll like. You know, there are a few things that I'll play that, uh, you know, are more to kind of drown out the world, but honestly, a lot of times it's more, it's stuff I've listened to over and over and over, so I know, like, I can't listen to a new album, I can listen to something I've listened to a hundred times, like, there's a, there's a playlist on my computer that uh, I put together in college that is just, like, it's just called Working, 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 and it was just, it is... Like, it's, God, uh, I, I don't even remember exactly what's on it because I don't perceive what's on it anymore. It is just like, it shuts out the rest of the world and then it's just music that can play through. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, like, if I reach the end of the playlist, hopefully I'm so invested in what I'm doing, even if there's noise, I'm not. Like, I, I'm definitely the person where I'll listen to a thing and then I'll have my headphones in for three hours after and not realize that nothing's been playing for two yeah. of those three hours. <laughs> um, but, yeah. The head, headphones are good because uh, when you don't want to be disturbed, you just put, even if you're not listening to anything, you just put them in and hopefully people will be alone. Uh, so the record I was looking for, it's the soundtrack to a movie called Turbo Kid, uh, which is this weird um, science fiction-y Netflix movie. Um, but I watched it when I was bored uh, once, and the soundtrack sounds like... Uh, it was okay. You know, it's like this. Like this yeah. sort of ambient 1980s good sort of synthy stuff. Yeah. Perfect. So highly recommended for any writers. Uh, right. If you just want to zone out and listen to the 1980 synth stuff, it's great. Turbo okay. Kid soundtrack. Turbo Kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and the man who fell to Earth, they actually just found that, the original recordings for that. Oh, cool. Like crazy music. Have you ever seen the movie? Mm -hmm. Go see, I mean, watch it. It's amazing. Stay the boat. Um, but they just found that and they're, they're re releasing it, or they're releasing it. And so I'm like, that's going to be great music because it's just very much like that. It's Crazy. Well, Blade Runner, Evangelist, you know, like oh, all yeah, that stuff. Blade Runner, Dream, any of that stuff is, yeah. you know. Actually, I listen to the Diva soundtrack a lot. Yeah. Not Flash Gordon, because then you're just going to go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question, Charles. Yes. <laughs> Since you're the other songwriter up here. What's the difference for you in the process when you sit down and write a song, and when you sit down to write a story, and is there any similarity? Or are you working in completely different universes? Um, I tend to, well, when I'm writing a, a song, I usually, like, I almost, almost never start with lyrics. Um, I start with music. I start with um, something I enjoy, a, a, a progression or a riff or a pattern I enjoy playing on guitar. Um, so that's what, I'll just play, play, play until something hooks me and I'm, like, playing it over and over again. And then I, so then, from there, it's, it's sort of that, that's, so I have an A section, and then I'll figure out maybe what the B section might be, but, um, and most of that is without lyrics at all. Uh, and then it's only when I have a song that's written musically that I'll start thinking about what the words might be. So it's, so it's completely kind of ass backwards from how I write a, a story in which the um, sort of the, the theme of it and the, what it's about comes first. So how do you do it? I tend to write from an emotion probably first. Mm -hmm. There's some feeling brewing, some angst or agony or some joy, and mm -hmm. I, I usually write them both together. I'll start pounding away. I, I, these days I write mostly on the piano. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, because for me, after so many years of playing, I'm, I'm really not a good piano player, mm -hmm. but I can compose on the piano. Yeah, same. I'm because sure. yep. you can put your fingers almost anywhere and create a chord that you never knew existed before. Right, right. And after years of playing the guitar, you tend to go to the same place. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So on the piano, it opened up a whole new vocabulary. Yep. And I'll just start looking for chords, and I'll start to sing the first thing that comes into my head, which is usually pushed out by that emotion. Right. And the two things come together. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll bang away for half an hour leave it, come back the next day and bang away for the same half an hour over the course of three days, there's a song there. And yeah. some days you want to bang them through. But So I guess I, this is good because I've never really thought about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And writing a story is the same thing. It's gonna, for me, it's coming from some emotion, some desire mm -hmm. to express something deep. So they both come from the same place, right. but the expression is very different because you got 
generally you know, maybe three or four minutes you're writing uh, for a song yep. that can express the depth of emotion that might be in the brothers Karamazov really in that three or four minutes because yep. music takes whatever is in the lyrics and pushes it a thousand percent right and touches people's hearts in a completely different way I also I find again I don't, I mean, we're sort of monopolized a little bit I apologize but if, I think that the um, I find that uh, a song for me is a much more unpredictable like I don't know how it's going to be received in the same like if I write an issue I kind of I feel like it's I'm it's much more finely tuned in a way that I can kind of predict the way it's going to be the way it's going to affect the readers. I think you know that's not always true, but like I, I feel like I'm getting more of it in. Whereas a song, like I, I just don't know what it's going to generate in the listener. Um, I don't know. It's just it's I, I think they're pretty different for me actually. Now that I now that I've never really thought about it before, but I think they're pretty different creative experiences. Right. I guess the root is that they're both this expression of this pure creative energy, but they're coming out through different forms and forms. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, um, a lot of creators are putting together playlists for their comics, like Wicked and Divine, they do that a lot. So you can go on and, and while you're reading this issue, you can listen to this music. Um, have any of you done any of that? Yeah, I did that. Um, I, did, I, did it with my, I did it with my self-published stuff a while ago, because I, I thought I was being clever and new. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Uh, that was like a few years ago, but of course, I didn't, it was self-published, so no one paid attention. Um, <laughs> I did, Amy. Did you? Yes. I put a lot of work into that, too. But it wasn't with the intent that you should um, uh, to read it and listen at the same time, because I think that in the end, it's, like, it's kind of really hard to do. I think it was really more just an add-on, you know, because you know, there's no sound in, in comics. I just thought it would be kind of a nice, nice another layer. You know, of course, you could listen to it. I mean, it would be too hard to sync. I don't know how fast you read the comic. I would probably read it in five minutes, and here you have a, a playlist that's 35 minutes. Um, but I did want to talk about this, this emotion thing, because I think that's actually true. I, I do write from emotion when I do a particular issue, like, for example, Poison Ivy in issue one. I'm like, I really need to have that feeling of uh, isolation and alienation, and that's really important to me. So I, I need to, and I, and I write to that. Um, but because it is a mystery and there's action and things that are happening, you have to put that in. But the emotional beats are very important and they have to occur in a certain frequency and length and things like that. Uh, I, I haven't done it because I don't, frank, like, I frankly don't even have the, like, the playlist. Like, it's, that's not how, like, how I experience music, so I don't, I, I've, I've been asked before, and it's just like I wouldn't even know where to start. Like I would have to be asking like a friend to <laughs> put together a playlist for me for something that I did, and trying to pass it off as something personal. So I didn't like I just sort of stayed away uh, from trying to tackle that. But um, yeah, uh, I haven't done a playlist. I'm considering. Um, I have a new series that's going to start in January. A new creator-owned series called Curse Words, and it's about Crazy Wizard and things like that, and I'm thinking about writing a song for each issue and sort of releasing them at the same time. Uh, but I also know that I tend to overcommit myself to doing things because I have a lot going on, and that might I might die. I might literally die if I try to do that. So it sounds like a great idea now. What about one per arc? One per arc. I don't well, know. I the theme song. Well, I did. I, I have that song uh, halfway done already. It's called <laughs> It's called Magic Man, and and the. Um, the first verse is, uh, how does it go? He's a magic man from a magic land. He's tragic Stan. Oh shit, what's the last part? Um, oh, he'll, he'll, he'll do his magic any way he can. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, so that's what you can expect from the songs. <laughs> the book is a lot better. <laughs> I actually wrote a, the only time I ever wrote a song that went with a piece of work was when I wrote a kid's novel a few years back called Imagine Alice. And I got really stuck in the middle of it. And I just picked up my guitar and I essentially wrote the Imagine Alice theme song. But it was a way of freeing up that energy. But that was the only time that ever happened for me. But uh, it, was, it was interesting and it really helped me. Did you ever release that song? No. Mm -mm. Just in your own head? Just in my own head. So you just played it in your head? Well, you I played it, it on the guitar. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I could play it just on my head, but yeah. it helps if I play it on the guitar. <laughs> okay, give me that copy. Mm -hmm. um, so, real quick, and then we'll have some questions. So, you've already kind of talked about your favorite type of music, favorite bands, but go. Yeah. Um, 
like I said, I, uh, a lot of my influence uh, in terms of music is musical theater. I really, uh, like I said, Stephen Sondheim is a huge influence on me. Uh, I would like, and then I also, uh, and I, like the, you know, I don't know. I also really enjoy like like I sort of brought up how I do uh, a lot of Disney songs uh, at karaoke, and part of it's because I really I really enjoy uh, like kids movies in general because they they have to deal with very complex emotions in a very simple way, and it's always really fascinating how they do that. And uh, you know, so the sort of did the. The soundtracks to the Disney Renaissance and the uh, late '80s, early '90s, like those, those are like uh, you know, uh, uh, I think those are mostly Ashton and Mankin, and those are incredible soundtracks. And the the other thing they did together is Little Shop of Horrors, which is also uh, amazing. Yeah. My wife just reminded me; I completely forgot about this. So, you know, you have these dreams and you're kind of going to grow up, I'm going to be a rock and roll star. So last year I was writing for the new Scooby-Doo cartoon on Cartoon Network. Yeah. And they have these little musical interludes and things that go on. And I was, and the story editor, who's also a musician, knows I was going to say, if you ever want to write a song for the show, you know, let, let me know. Mm -hmm. And and there was, it was about a dog show. And Scooby got into a talent show and I suddenly realized they needed a song for the talent show. You know? <laughs> so just for fun, I sat down and in about you know, five, ten minutes wrote this song and quickly recorded it and sent it to them. They're going to use it in the episode. Oh, it has a great awesome. So I'm thinking, you know, all these years, I'm, like, I'm waiting for my big break and this Here is in an episode of Scooby-Doo. You know? And you take it where you can get it, right? Exactly. Uh -oh. You get what you can. Uh, I completely forgot about that. <laughs> How does it go? I'm not good. It's, it's, it's called Dancing Paw to Toe. It's like a Cole Porter number, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of just get into these musical ruts until I end up getting hired to write somebody's you know, graphic novel. So then I end up listening, obviously, to a lot of Kiss and uh, DMC. But I think I naturally default, like, um, you know, I'm kind of like a. a Daisy Age, Tribe Called Quest kind of, like I like happy music if I'm trying to get a lot of energy to do things. Um, it's a lot of 80s just because it's, 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 it's in the background, I don't have to think about it. And you bands, I really kind of need new, new suggestions because really it's, it's kind of pathetic. I really don't know what's out anymore. Uh, so recently I've been listening to, um, let's see, uh, there's a guy named Aesop Rock who I just found who I really like, I'm just scrolling through my iTunes right here, uh, Freddy <laughs> Rabbit, which is a Scottish band, um, I was talk talking to you about them earlier, they're sort of this anthemic, huge, really great lyrics, uh, very angsty, scottish -y stuff, um, Craig Finn, Old Steady, uh, what else have I been listening to recently? They're really good, you should get them all. Um, uh, Mike Stern, who's a great jazz guitarist, he's been around for a long, long time. I got back into him recently. I sort of dropped in and out, but he, I saw him and he was fantastic. Uh, gosh, what else? Uh, Taylor Swift, actually, I've been massively into Taylor Swift over the last uh, year or so. Um, uh, the Ryan Adams version of her record in 1989. Yeah, so I'm kind of all over the place, that's but. Fine. That's fine, I don't care. It's great. Like, I don't think there's any shame in liking any type of music. Music speaks to you how it speaks to you. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Who else listens to it? You could like kids bop, and maybe that's your favorite thing. It doesn't matter. Um, music is personal, and and I think judging people for the music taste is it's just like why? It's like judging people for the comics taste. Yeah, that's true. It's so, absolutely true. Yeah, take it is great. Okay, so we have a couple questions. So, you, Eric, and then you. so first of all, uh, suggestion on Amanaguchi. Um, it's it's uh, uh, chip tunes, but with a rock band also. Very happy music. Happy music. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I recommend uh, looking up their song on Prom Night. It's really good. Okay. Um, How do you spell that? Huh? Ana I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. okay. Um, but uh, my question my question is there's there's a uh, when you write words there's a bit of a rhythm to it. So the the uh, extreme end would be uh, poetry or Dr. Seuss. I would like to see uh, Batman in I Am a Pantameter. <laughs> um, well, that's what, right? Like yeah. when you write the demon, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So it's a real challenge and it's hard. really fun. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah great. So I, I did it one time and I was like, all right, I've done it. I don't have to do it again. Yeah. But it, it was, was awesome. Of time, so it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So my question was for the for the songwriters: Do you find yourself writing to a certain rhythm within the bubbles um, when you're writing Run DMC? Do you find like a certain rhythm since you know they were uh, rap artists? And then do you have, find any rhythm even though you're not uh, musically related? Uh, I just want to say, Amy, she rides this way. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, 
panel over. Um, I write the character, so if I think that they have a rhythm, sure. But I, for DMC, I was specifically told, they're not, they're, this is not a universe where they really rap, so um, in terms of rhythm, it's really more of what I think their speech patterns would be like. Uh, and I I'm also tend to be extremely brief in my dialogue. I don't like to go on and on. Um, uh, so there is, a, there is a rhythm, I guess, if you read it, but I tend to be more um, high too than okay. anything. Okay. I think, I think, you know, uh, I teach writing classes sometimes and I talk a lot about design. It's what I said at the very beginning. The very way that we tell the story, and I'm not saying we do it consciously, but because everything is in these little captions and these little bubbles, there's a very, I, I find there's a very specific rhythm, almost a drum beat going on. And, uh, and there's a link between lyric writing, there's a link to poetry as well, because we're writing in these short bursts. And then does the caption create something that the, the dialogue plays a different rhythm from the caption? And you go back to the caption and across the page, and then you get a whole uh, very involved drum beat going on. You know, so I, it's very much there for me. Uh, I, I'm not saying I sit down and do a concert, because as Amy said, you're writing to the characters all the time. but. There's, there's a doorway between songwriting and poetry and comics. You know, the thing that drives me most crazy are people that say that comics are, are movies on paper. It's like, that's the last thing that comic books are to me. There are so many different things, and one of the things they are, there's a level of poetry and, and, and lyric writing that goes into the way you structure the page. And, and you know, comics are often very melodramatic and very poetic, and just as song lyrics are. So there is absolutely, for me, uh, a place where they meet. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean that. I, I I definitely don't think of it as uh, I don't think of it in terms of the music of it, but I do think of it in terms of the uh, the flow of language and the making sure you hit the like hit the right hit the right word with the right weight and all of that. And it is it is rhythmic. It is about uh, finding the flow. Like I write uh, I write in a kind of rough flow. That's my first uh, first draft of everything. I kind of panel in my I, the paneling's in my head, but and I go back to it after because I, I ride with the dialogue and captions and all that, and I sort of see how it all lays out, and I see the moments where it's just like, okay, like this needs to be sort of condensed into this single moment, and this needs to be expanded so I can hit this beat, that beat, that beat. Um, so it's like my my first drafts are kind of unreadable to anyone but me because it's just like you, you know, especially scenes that are intercutting between different things because it's like. If you just look at it, it looks like, are all these characters in the same room? But it's just like, it is kind of just finding uh, the flow of ideas and language. And uh, that that once I find that flow, once I find that rhythm, I have the issue. OK. okay uh, my question is primarily for you, James. But uh, anyway, else, feel free to put something else in, because uh, <laughs> you interested me with your mention of musical theater. Yeah. Um, and OK. Aside from like the obviously the Disney classics, by the way, um, did you know there was a cut song for Jafar? So when it fixed, yeah, I mean, yes, I did. I, uh, I think uh, it, did they put that in the stage musical? I think they might. I don't know if they put it in the stage musical, but uh, there's a recording of it with the original artist. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I've uh, heard that. <laughs> sidebar: you were talking about Disney villain songs, but in musical theater, are there some deep bass songs that you really enjoy as opposed to? I mean, you mentioned Sondheim in general, but is there like specific ones that you really like? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I think Being Alive from uh, uh, Company is just like an absolute like work of genius, especially because it's it's the saddest, optimistic song that I think, like it, it speaks to so many different parts of the human experience. I just I, I adore that song. Um, I also think that. Uh, God, the I'm blanking on the last. It's the last song from uh, "Merrily We Roll Along," which is uh, it's basically "Merrily We Roll Along" is one of the most fascinating failures in musical theater because it was it's a it's a brilliant idea for a show, but it doesn't it has never quite been executed in the right way. Uh, but it's uh, it was basically it's a show that starts at the ending and then goes back towards the beginning, and it ends with these this group of uh, young 20-somethings and they are so optimistic about their lives and what they are going to be able to accomplish and conquer the world together with their with their music, with their writing, with all of that. And it's just the most like rousing, upbeat song. But it's the last thing and but the show started with all of their friendships ending 
because the, it's just everything, everything fell apart. Everything, all of that optimism, like, fell apart, and it's just like, and it brings together all the musical themes that, that, that we've been seeing, the, uh, the like, I, I don't have the terminology, but the, um, but basically the, like, we've been seeing some of the, the bits of that, that song over the course of the musical in darker ways, and we see the optimistic version of that song hitting all of these notes. So like, like this major Yeah, exactly, and it is, uh, it, it really is astonishing, and, uh, that's one of those shows where I've listened to the soundtrack a hundred times and I've seen it a few times, but uh, when I see it, it's just like, oh right, this is why it's never worked on stage. <laughs> uh, but like the idea of the show is still genius. And to expand the question to you guys, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm taking too much time, please don't shut me up. Um, does musical theater interest you guys? Is that something that includes your work at all? Oh, you said you're a music critic, so you probably well, ran into it. You know, I always hated musical theater. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it just wasn't my thing, you know? I just, it just, I would like cringe, and you know, don't, please don't make me watch the sound of music or whatever, you know, any of that stuff. And then I had this daughter. Yeah. What? Oh, that's true. First, my, we went to see Les Mis, and that got me, I have to say. After, in the beginning, the Brooklyn in me came out, and was like, I said to my, they're gonna sing through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end, I was like sobbing. That was a good, but still, that was like that was a one-off. And then I had this daughter who, from the time she was really little, wanted to be in theater, and she started doing plays when she was eight or nine years old. And I would watch all these plays, and I would listen to all these soundtracks, and then I'd be sitting there watching these kids and sobbing too. So it, it, that opened my uh, my mind and my heart to musical theater in a way it never had been before. Does it, is it anything I personally carry with me? No, but I have a much bigger appreciation for it. So you let did. it go. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, yeah, I could go see Wicked and get very emotional. Anybody else? Well, this is kind of horrible, but um, you know, again, like I lived in this house where my mom hated musical theater, anything Broadway, so I never even watched Sound of Music. I still haven't seen Sound of Music, so I'm probably the only person who's never seen it. It's worth it. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and it's kind of sounds so snotty, uh, but I, I did have access to opera and I was very interested in um, the storytelling that goes on in opera. It can be quite dense and inaccessible, but in the back of my mind, I was I would love to adapt it into a, a comic. A lot of these stories are very intrinsically, you know, human human stories, uh, but people don't, don't, you know, who, who watches or who listens to opera anymore, you know? Okay, uh, but right? There's some great stories in there. They, they, they need to be modernized, but you know, I really, really want to take some of these, like, the, the, uh, image book. You'll, you'll see the image book for me, and I'll, then you'll be like, that's La Traviata. You know? Nice. Um, I have I've lived in New York City for a long time at this point, uh, and so there's not a lot of access to musical theater there, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it hasn't been a big part of my, my musical history at this point, but at some point, maybe I'll get to play shows more of it around. Probably. We'll see what I can do. Yeah, maybe. Okay, uh, question? This is kind of for Charles. Sure. In, in 27, yeah. that's probably one of the most musical things I've ever written, right? And it kind of starts off in a way where there's so much, like, 90, like Kurt Cobain, like mm -hmm. the beginning of it. And then it turns, as you move through it, it becomes more like rock opera-ish and very much in the doom as, as it moves through. And then it becomes incredibly mathematical and how that mathematical piece flows with music and rhythm. Mm -hmm. it, it, did you feel that as it was, or was that intended? But to me, it was that, yeah. the fact that you were gonna be on this panel and the music and think that's why I believe you belong here. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I wrote a whole, we haven't really talked about it, but I wrote, one of my first creator projects was 27, which was about, I mean, the hook of it was it was about somebody who turns 27 and then gets hit by the same curse that, that took out Amy Winehouse, uh, Kirk Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, that's, that was the sort of the high concept to it that would get people interested in and maybe want to read it, but as you mentioned, really it's about, it was about my thoughts on creativity and, and where the muse comes from and, and what music is and what it means and, and how it's sort of the magical elements to it, right? Because I think the music is is both um, incredibly formal and and uh, structured and has an underlying mathematics to it, right? There is, you can analyze music uh, mathematically, but if you ask a computer to compose music along the same lines as a, uh, 
you know, as a Mozart piece or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't have the magic to it. It doesn't have the emotional connection to it. So I think the fact that music is equal parts math and, and emotion and power and, and mystery is one of the things, it's just fascinating to me. And, and that synthesis is something that uh, I see very, very directly when I'm writing a, uh, a piece, um, particularly a classical or jazz piece, where, where there's a lot of musical theory involved. Like, I don't know if anybody here is like deep into music theory, but I mean, you, you are, I'm sure, but it's like, it's, it's extremely dense and extremely challenging, um, and it, it is like high level math, really. Uh, so, so when you see a great like bot player like playing, like a Charlie Parker or something like that, they are doing instinctive, unbelievable math in their head that just, they, they're geniuses, you don't have to think about it, right? They're, they're Einsteins. Um, and so I was trying in 27 to get some of those ideas across in a way that was still engaging and entertaining. So it certainly seemed like it worked with you, which is great. Um, and if the rest of you haven't read it, well, hey, there it is. It's waiting for you. Are you related to Dan DiDio? I know! <laughs> they got their picture taken really together. I scared you twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had probably your last question. Um, you, you guys have talked... You guys have talked about how there's the parallel between you know music and, and comics. Um, speaking from your creative aspect, do you feel more like a solo artist, or do you feel more like you're in a band at, while while writing? Because as a writer, like, do you write specifically just for the story you're writing, or do you write for the artist and the colorist and and the publication that you're writing? Kind of like a band mentality. You always have to. It's comics. You always have to keep the artist in mind. You're always collaborating. It's, it's, you can't not have that in mind. Even if you don't know who the artist is, you're seeing visuals, you know? And then when you're getting into collaborative writing, which was when I worked with Keith Giffen, it's a whole other thing. It's like composing a song together, you know? Um, so so um, it's a small band. It's not an orchestra. It's a very small, intimate band, though, you know? Uh, and that's the great thing about comics is that it is still when you get down to the creative team, it's very small and very intimate, and even when you're working on these mainstream characters, it allows us lots of room to imprint our own personalities in it. But then when you have a couple of strong personalities working sometimes in opposition, the way Lennon and McCartney say worked in opposition and created something very unique, um, the push and pull between two writers, or the writer and the artist, creates something that you never could have created alone. That's a great question. I mean, it also depends if it's... Um I think creator own. Um, like when, when I started off doing more of the creator own stuff, I felt like it really was like a lot of jazz improv because we had a lot of um, uh, back and forthness as we were going along and more freedom. Um, whereas I think as we, I, I start doing more and more mainstream work, there's a lot more rigidity and um, less. Uh, more likely, I'm not going to know the artist as well, and there's going to be a time lag, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this, this is my mentality. I think that is what comics is about. It's ensemble. Um, but sometimes you do have to originate at least the structure, and then hopefully it comes back to you and you can go back and forth on it. Okay. That's probably everything we have time for today. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Thank you.